Hey everyone, we are going to be covering bacteria that infect the digestive system. So when we look at the digestive system, there are several organs that already harbor microflora. The major ones are the oral cavity, which has up to 700 different species of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protists. Bacteria that are found in the large intestine or target any of the intestines are sometimes called enteric bacteria. Uh, generally, the most common uh, shape and gram stain of the bacteria that comprise the enteric microflora are going to be gram-negative bacilli. So that means gram-negative rods. So that's the most common shape and uh, gram stain that we see in the large intestine. So when we think about sites that can be infected, we have the oral cavity, that's largely going to be the teeth and the gum line, so that falls under the purview of dentists. We have the pharynx, which is the throat. We already talked about that with Streptococcus pyosians. Surprisingly, the stomach can be colonized by one known bacteria. And then the small intestine and large intestine are the major sites of infection. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to review them in that order, minus the pharynx, because that was already covered. So we're going to start with the oral cavity. So the vast, vast, vast majority of bacterial infections in the oral cavity are centered around the teeth and therefore, again, are going to be under the purview of dentistry. So what happens on the teeth? Well, you guys probably already know, it's cavities. So tooth decay or cavities has a more formal name of dental caries. And you'll see in this image here that we actually have several layers to our teeth. The outer layer is called the enamel and the enamel is protective. However, enamel can be degraded by routine exposure to acids. So that's gonna be a key feature to being able to get underneath the enamel to the next layer, which is shown here in kind of a, a tan color. That's the dentin, and then below that is the pulp. And so we have various layers of decay, so to speak. So what causes dental caries? Dental caries is actually caused by a community effort or a group effort. So there are multiple species that all play a role in the formation of dental caries. That said, there is one species whose participation is critical, and that is Streptococcus mutans. So because Streptococcus mutans is considered to be a critical um, and necessary member of this community effort to cause decay, we can pin the causative agent uh, tag onto Streptococcus mutans. So Streptococcus mutans is an alpha hemolytic Streptococcus. Here's a very nice summary of some of the features of both dental caries and Streptococcus mutans role uh, taken from an article, the references below. So let's go through this quickly. So dental caries or cavities is a result of a biofilm. So biofilm just means an aggregation of bacteria that come together and they're usually held together by some sort of extracellular matrix like a slime layer. So slime layers are very typical for biofilms. Um, on our teeth, that biofilm is known as plaque. Now Streptococcus mutans uh, plays two roles in the formation of caries. One role is that it actually lays the groundwork for the biofilm. So when I think about how a biofilm is formed, I think about a cotton candy machine. If you are familiar with cotton candy machines, you know that you put some sugar crystals in the center and then the cotton candy is basically wisps of those sugars blown out and so I think of the streptococcus mutants taking sugars, like the sugar crystals. In this case, the sugar is sucrose, which is refined sugar or sugar cane or corn syrup. And it basically blows out these sugar wisps or these sugar strings, much like cotton candy. And so that's the slime layer. And it's really only able to do that with sucrose. If you give it a different sugar substance like fructose, which is found in fruit, it's not able to do that. Okay, so again, Streptococcus mutans is only going to be able to do this with sucrose, not with fructose or unnatural sugar.
So once Streptococcus mutans gets a hold of the sucrose and it basically blows out this web of polysaccharides or the slime layer, then other bacteria can adhere to it as well as Streptococcus mutans. And so that forms the biofilm that is known as plaque. Now the plaque unfortunately traps the bacteria against your teeth, including Streptococcus mutans. And Streptococcus mutans, when it aggregates in this biofilm, will ferment and produce acid. And so this is where when you look down the line here and we see this term says is acidogenic and acid tolerant, that means it produces acid. Acidogenic just means to generate acid and tolerant just means and it can live in the, its own acid production. So it is able to produce the acid that degrades the enamel. And once it does that, other bacteria that are part of that biofilm will actually get in and start degrading the dentin, and if it progresses, it'll go into the pulp and cause a serious infection. So just to show you how like prolific these bacteria are, this is showing an image of the uh, Streptococcus mutans bacteria. Again, you can see the Streptococcus uh, arrangement, and you can see just how many of them there are in the biofilm. You can also see some of these other things going on here. That's all part of the, the extracellular um, cotton candy mix that they make. Okay, so as I said pr uh, previously, because Streptococcus mutans is considered to be the gateway bacteria to the formation of biofilm, and then it produces the acid that degrades the enamel, then we, um, we consider Streptococcus mutans to be the causative agent of dental caries. Now, there's a lot of other factors that can affect somebody's risk of cavities or dental caries. So diet is a main one. Eating a diet rich in sucrose gives Streptococcus mutans its favorite substrate to make the biofilm. Um, another one is having Streptococcus mutans. So we did the Snyder auger test in the lab most people had a, a pretty low or negative result for the Snyder auger, which indicates that there's not a lot of Streptococcus mutants in their mouth, but Streptococcus mutants is found in 85 to 90% of all mouths. It is considered to be transmittable, meaning that you know, you're not born with it. It is transmitted through saliva, and therefore technically caries is a transmittable disease. We also know that the thickness of the enamel, which is genetically determined, um, will impact your propensity for caries. And then another treatment is fluoride. In the United States, we add fluoride to our water. We take fluoride treatments and fluoride is considered to help repair enamel. So with that, let's talk about something else that you might have seen when going to a dentist. So when you go to a dentist and you go for the first time, you are asked to fill out all of this information on a questionnaire. And a surprising number of the questions start asking about your heart, like, have you had rheumatic fever? Do you have a mitral valve prolapse? In other words, they're starting to ask about your heart valves. Why? Why is the dentist care all about your heart valves? Well, it turns out there is a good reason for all of those questions. There is a bacterial disease called bacterial endocarditis. And bacterial endocarditis is going to be colonization of the heart valves, specifically the atrioventricular valves, which are shown in the arrows there. Now, there's a number of different bacteria that can cause bacterial endocarditis, but one group that causes them are alpha hemolytic streptococci, including streptococcus mutans, but there are many others that are found in the oral cavity. Um, and so because they are a major causative agent of, of the AV valves that, and therefore can cause bacterial endocarditis, you are at risk of developing bacterial endocarditis if you introduce a large quantity of alpha hemolytic streptococci into your bloodstream during an invasive dental procedure such as a root canal or getting your wisdom teeth pulled. So anybody who goes and has some invasive dental procedure done is going to bleed a lot. And then that blood or those open blood vessels are going to pick up some of the oral cavity microflora, including a bunch of alpha hemolytic streptococci that are going to go into the blood. Okay, 
So what makes you at risk of bacterial endocarditis and why are they asking all these questions about your, your heart? Well, it turns out that as long as blood is flowing in a one-way fashion through your heart, your chances of bacteria colonizing those valves are pretty low. So just a quick anatomy or physiology recap. You have blood that comes in from a vein, it goes into the atrium, it goes into the ventricle, and from the ventricle it gets pumped out into an artery. So again, this is anatomy and physiology, and that's how it's supposed to go. And what allows the blood to flow one way, of course, are going to be these valves that shut. So for instance, when blood is supposed to go from a ventricle out to an artery, what prevents blood from going back to the atrium is in fact these atrioventricular valves that shut close and say, no, 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 you can't go back that way. You got to go this way out the artery. Okay. But if those valves are leaky or compromised somehow, then they don't work as a complete seal. And therefore, blood that moves down into the ventricle can backwash into the atrium. This actually produces a sound on the stethoscope, and it is known as a heart murmur. So you can actually hear these leaky valves because they produce a lot of backwash. And it increases your risk of bacterial endocarditis because if you have bacteria that are in the bloodstream and the bacteria are constantly backwashing over those valves, so they're going from the ventricle back to the atria and the ventricle back to the atria, eventually they're going to sit down on that valve and go, gotcha, I'm going to colonize this area and, um, and cause endocarditis. And endocarditis is a nasty, nasty disease that can be fatal. So it's, it creates these like yellow plaquish nodules all over the AV valves. And those nodules can break off, go into the bloodstream, and basically act like a clot, causing a stroke, a heart attack, etc. So it's bad. You do not want bacterial endocarditis. So again, the risk for bacterial endocarditis following an invasive dental procedure is going to be a lot higher if your atrioventricular valves are leaky. So this is why the dentist will ask all about your heart valves. So what if you do have leaky heart valves? Like what if you have a mitral valve prolapse or you have rheumatic fever or you have stenosis or something else? Then they are likely to give you antibiotics prophylactically. Now, prophylactic antibiotics simply means that you are getting antibiotics in advance of getting an infection to prevent the infection that they suspect will happen from occurring. So prophylactic antibiotics, again, just means giving antibiotics in the advance of an infection, expecting that there is a high risk of infection and trying to prevent it. Okay, so now we're going to move on and take a look at stomach. So the stomach has a bunch of cells that can produce um, hydrochloric acid, HCl. And hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid. So therefore, the stomach is the great sterilizer. It can bring the pH as low as one and kill almost everything that's in there. So it's shocking to learn that there's that some bacteria not only survive that, but some can actually live there and colonize it, but with some modifications. And so the one species that is capable of colonizing the stomach is Helicobacter pylori. Now Helicobacter pylori, the name Helicobacter stands for the fact that it kind of almost looks like a little bit of a spirillum. It is between a vibrium and a spirillum, but it kind of kinks, so that's the helico part. And pylori, you guys might know from anatomy, the pylorus is a region of the stomach, where the pyloric sphincter leads the, from the stomach out to the duodenum. Okay, so how does helicobacter pylori cause infections? So interestingly enough, Helicobacter pylori, when it gets into the stomach, will secrete urease, which is an enzyme. The enzyme is going to break down um, urea into ammonia, and ammonia acts as a base to basically neutralize the surrounding acid. And that's how it survives locally, and then it tries to go and find the least acidic part of the stomach. Well, that happens to be this uh, gastric mucin gel that basically coats over most of your other epithelial cells to prevent them from being damaged by this 
pH of wine. So in your stomach, you've got these gastric cells that secrete hydrochloric acid, but that hydrochloric acid doesn't just kill bacteria, it would kill your own cells too. So you try to protect your own cells with kind of like, like layer of agar. It almost feels like, looks like, like gelatinous agar. Say, no, 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 we're gonna protect our own cells. So these bacteria bore into that gel, that protective gel. And when they do that, that actually uh, allows uh, some of that acid to get into the epithelial cells and damage them. And that can lead to ulcers and the routine damage can also lead to cancer. So Helicobacter pylori causes almost all stomach uh, ulcers and cancers. So where does Helicobacter pylori come from? Honestly, we don't know. Um, we're not really able to find it in the water supply, etc. So we think that it's probably just uses humans as a reservoir, it probably uses oral fecal route, children probably get colonized, and then at some point uh, the disease progresses into stomach ulcers and cancers. We do see a correlation with development of the country and um, Helicobacter pylori rates of infection, where areas that um, don't have a lot of sanitary uh, infrastructure to help with their water supply. The H. pylori infection rates can be 80%, but in the United States it's probably between 5 and 6%, and a lot of those are asymptomatic. Okay, so now that we've covered that, let's go ahead and turn to the big area of infection, which is our intestines. When we talk about intestinal infections, the mouth is always going to be the portal of entry for anything new. That said, we can look at these intestinal diseases in two different ways. One way is the idea of actually consuming a preformed toxin or an enterotoxin. The word entero, by the way, just means intestine. So a toxin that targets the intestine that's on your food. The reason why this one is special is because it's not the bacteria, it's the toxin. That, that is causing the disease. An enteric infection is different. This is going to be where you actually get a new pathogen that is going to colonize or invade the small or large intestine, replicate and cause disease that way. So let's, let's look at some differences. In the enterotoxin poisoning, what happens is you eat food that somebody has previously contaminated with a certain species of bacteria, the species of bacteria are allowed to live, replicate, and grow on that food, and then they secrete these large quantities of these enterotoxins that land on the food. So once the toxins are on the food, most of the toxins are heat labile, which means that they can withstand high heat. Even if you put that food back in the microwave, for instance, to reheat it, you'll kill the bacteria, but you won't kill the toxin. And so when you eat it, the toxin gets absorbed in the stomach, it activates the nausea center of the brain, and you start vomiting profusely. Depending on the type of toxin and the causative agent, you can also have uh, diarrhea that goes with it, but vomiting is the major one. So one of the hallmarks of food intoxication or enterotoxin poisoning is an extremely short incubation period. We're talking well, for me, it was 15 minutes, um, but usually it's like hour, maybe, like 30 minutes to an hour, and there's no fever associated with it. It's also over pretty quickly, like it's over within a couple hours to 24 hours, and you're back to normal usually within a couple days. So let's contrast this to the actual infection by bacteria that are replicating somewhere in our intestine. So in this case, you're ingesting the full pathogenic bacteria, and if you ingest the pathogenic bacteria, they're able to survive, or at least some of them are able to survive the stomach, and then they get swept into the intestine. So once they're in the intestine, they can colonize or invade the large intestine or small intestine. We'll be looking at that in a little bit. But one of the major symptoms is going to be diarrhea. Um, yeah, you can vomit as well, but diarrhea is the big one, um, whereas enterotoxin poisoning Vomiting is the big one, and diarrhea is kind of secondary. Here, diarrhea is the number one um, symptom. Vomiting is a secondary symptom. And, um, and then there's often a fever associated with it. You have a longer incubation period. The incubation period is usually days, and the duration of the infection is usually five to seven days, which coincides with how long it takes to produce antibodies, to the bacteria and then reduce their numbers to a really low amount.
Now, interestingly enough, after an enteric infection, you may not completely eradicate that bacteria, but rather the antibodies keep the numbers so low that they just stay as part of your resident microflora, but they're not able to cause disease in you anymore. That doesn't mean that you can't transmit it to other people though. And so this is what happens a lot when people travel. They'll go to a new area, they get exposed to a, a new pathogen in the water supply or in the food that doesn't affect the local population because they've already been exposed to it, developed antibodies, and now they're carrying it asymptomatically. But to you, it's new, you don't have those antibodies, and that causes what is known as traveler's diarrhea. All right, so let's take a look at these in more detail. We're gonna start with the enterotoxin poisoning, and then we'll move over and look at four species that cause enteric infections. Enterotoxin poisoning. There's actually more than two causative agents, but the big ones are gonna be Staphylococcus aureus and Bacillus cereus. Now, I wanna come back to the idea that staph tends to be salt tolerant. So when we think about how we store our foods, you know, like cutting meats, for instance, we put salt in our meat to prevent bacteria from colonizing them because salt kills most bacteria, but it's not staph. Staph likes the salt or at least tolerates it. This is a better picture that kind of shows a little bit about that nausea center of the brain being um, influenced by the gastric uh, trigger. Okay. Where are your sources of food for enterotoxic poisoning? Usually somebody has contaminated the food with Staphylococcus aureus, like from the nasal cavity, in other words, they picked their nose and then they touched your food, um, or Bacillus cereus. Salt is not going to help with this. Refrigeration will help with this. So this is why you're supposed to keep like your meats and other stuff cold is because that slows down the metabolic growth rate and therefore the bacteria are unlikely to replicate to the level that they're secreting lots of toxins. Okay, I want to reiterate that heating up your food after the toxin is already on your food is not going to do anything for you. It'll kill the bacteria, but not the toxin. Conversely, you can prevent the toxin from being shed onto your food by one, making sure that you don't contaminate your food with Staphylococcus aureus or Bacillus cereus, and two, if you do contaminate your food, at least keeping the numbers low by keeping your food refrigerated. So a lot of cases of enterotoxic poisoning happens with cold cut meats that have been left out for too long at room temperature. Let's look at some themes for the enteric infections. So enteric infections are the actual infection in the small or large intestine. Different species like different areas. So some species like the small intestine, some colonize the large intestine. Some colonize, which means they stay outside of the cell and some invade, which means they actually go inside of the cell. In general, an enteric infection is going to be a much more serious disease than intoxication. Intoxications are rarely fatal, um, whereas enteric infections can be fatal. And uh, in fact, they are the number one cause of mortality for children. And that is because enteric infections are going to result in long-term diarrhea that leaves people severely dehydrated. Now, if you have diarrhea that draws, let's say four liters of water from your body, you as an adult might be able to handle that loss of four liters, but a child that's this big is not going to be able to handle that loss. So in other words, like a 10 pound child can't lose four liters of water and live. And again, the dehydration can be really, really serious. So enteric infections typically last between five and seven days. And, um, and then once your antibodies come out, that usually ends the infectious period, but not always. So we'll look at some exceptions to that. We are gonna cover four groups of organisms that cause enteric uh, infections. We'll look at Salmonella, the non-typhoid version. We'll look at Shigella. We'll look at E. coli, and then we'll look at Vibrio cholera. So I wanna look at the mechanism of action for diarrhea. So if you are a colonizer, in other words, you're not gonna be invasive, you just sit on the surface of a cell and you cause an infection that way, then the diarrhea is going to be watery, 
and there are two ways that you can develop diarrhea. Um, one way is that you stop absorbing the water, and so the water accumulates in your intestine, and then it basically flushes out. That creates a very watery diarrhea. Another way, which is less watery, is that the presence of the bacteria on the uh, intestinal wall causes colitis or inflammation of the intestine, and as part of the inflammatory response, fluid comes out into the intestine, and then as fluid accumulates, you end up having diarrhea. If the species is invasive, then usually it can penetrate into the blood, it can cause destruction of the epithelial lining, and if that's the case, then you are looking at blood in the stool. Bloody diarrhea is referred to as dysentery. So dysentery is a little more severe, and the invasive species, because they can get past the cells into the bloodstream, can often cause systemic infections as well. So in general, invasive species are gonna cause a more severe disease than a colonizing will. And that's a very general statement there. All right, let's start by looking at salmonella. Most people have heard of salmonella poisoning before. Now we've already covered a little bit salmonella typhi, which causes typhoid fever. Typhoid fever is its own thing. So we're gonna ignore typhoid fever. I'm talking about the generic salmonella poisoning, which is still pretty awful, but it's not quite as uh, fatal as salmonella typhi is. So the reservoir for a lot of these salmonella species are poultry, so chickens, and so therefore we tend to see a pretty strong correlation between chicken meat, eggs, and because farms are sometimes mixed, the salmonella can spread to like leafy greens and can contaminate produce as well. All right, these are an invasive species and they target the small intestine, specifically the ileum. People can die of salmonella poisoning. Most people don't, but they can. Typically, like most of these enteric infections, the illness will resolve within about a week. All right, next on our list is Shigella. Shigella causes shigellosis. Shigella is invasive, and it is invasive in the large intestine. So what it does is it actually invades specific cells that are called M cells in our large intestine, and it uses those sites to basically gain access to our immune cells that it also invades. So Shigella can actually be spread around the body via the immune cells, and so it can become a systemic disease. Interestingly enough, um, the reservoir is humans. That said, Shigella is responsible for a lot of traveler's diarrhea, and it is responsible for about 700,000 deaths per year, mostly in children. Okay, so again, invasive in the large intestine, the reservoir for this one is humans, unlike uh, salmonella, where the reservoir is chickens. Uh, it can cause a systemic disease, it causes dysentery, and it is responsible for a lot of fatalities. Now, Shigella can produce something called a Shiga toxin. If it produces a Shiga toxin, then the Shiga toxin damages the kidney. And if you have Shigella that produces this Shiga toxin, again, not all strains do, and you end up with kidney damage, then that can be fatal by itself. At the very least, you can be in the ICU for two years with that Shiga toxin causing kidney damage. It is really serious. All right, so with that, let's take a look at enterohemorrhagic E. coli. The word entero means gut, hemorrhagic means bleeding. So there are thousands of different species of E. coli. Um, the pathogenic ones usually have virulence factors that are carried on plasmids. And since plasmids are so easy to transfer via lateral gene transfer, um, E. coli readily exchanges and picks up these virulence factors. And one of the virulence factors that a certain strain of E. coli has picked up is the Shiga toxin, which I just mentioned. And that strain is 0157H7. 0157H7 is found in cattle, so that's the reservoir. And when cattle poop, then their manure can be used as fertilizer for leafy greens. And so these 0157H7 strains can colonize 
anything that's pretty low to the ground and therefore might have trace amounts of manure on it. Lettuce, spinach, those are kind of the main ones, uh, celery that we think of. In addition, ground beef, which can include the rumen of cattle and therefore the bacteria, can also have O157H7. In fact, O157H7 strain, which again produces the Shiga toxin, so not only would this cause dysentery, if you were to consume this and it were to infect you, it would cause dysentery, um, it would cause severe dehydration, and it would cause kidney damage. So, the first outbreak of O157H7 was actually linked to a set of jack-in-the-box restaurants in 1993 in Washington. And actually a few people died from that. So this is an image of the newspaper clipping that talks about that. So what happened? Well, people were eating hamburgers and the hamburgers were undercooked. And so the hamburger meat had been contaminated with O157H7 E. coli strain that produced the Shiga toxin. People ate these undercooked hamburgers. The bacteria um, colonized their large, or sorry, invaded their large intestine and then produced the Shiga toxin. A lot of these people were in the ICU for years. I mean, years. That's a very long time. So this was the first outbreak associated with O157H7 and it actually prompted a whole bunch of changes in how fast food restaurants had to make sure that they cooked their meats appropriately. They couldn't leave them out under a warmer or that it had to be a certain temperatures to make sure that the bacteria were killed. Now, interestingly enough, after this, um, 1993, there was another outbreak that was associated with Odwalla. You know, the, so Odwalla was kind of at the forefront of the, I don't know what else to call it, the Whole Foods, granola kind of movement of food. And so they did not pasteurize their apple juice. Now, their apple juice got contaminated with O157H7. How did that happen? Apples are in a tree, not on the ground like leafy vegetables are. So how is it that they got contaminated? Because it's cheaper to go and get a tree shaker and go, let me shake that tree and make all the apples fall to the ground and then scoop up the apples than it is to actually pay somebody to pick the apples. So Adwala was like, whoops, our bad. Oh yeah, and we don't pasteurize because, you know, that would, that would cost money. <laughs> so they sold all of this apple juice contaminated and some people got really sick and a little girl died. Again, that was 1996. They had to start pasteurizing their drinks and they had to do a big mea culpa about not picking apples up off the ground, but rather picking them from the trees. So since that time, we see O157H7 outbreaks associated with ground beef. That can basically be solved by just cooking your meat appropriately. And then leafy vegetables, which you just need to avoid when you have those outbreaks. And again, the leafy vegetables tend to be like spinach or lettuce or celery that tends to be low to the ground. So once again, I'm going to reiterate that if you happen to get O157H7 version of E. coli, the real damage isn't necessarily from the diarrhea and the dysentery, but the production of the Shiga toxin, which causes um, uh, potentially fatal kidney damage. All right, our very last one is going to be cholera. So cholera is caused by Vibrio cholera. The reservoir tends to be water, although it can be people, it tends to be water. And in fact, you can even find cholera in the ocean. Now, the minimum infectious dose is really high for cholera. But if you have a contaminated water sample and you drink it, then that bacteria can, at least some of them, can make it through the stomach into the small intestine where it colonizes it. And you can see that here. So here's the vibrios. So again, vibrio stands for the name, kind of a rod shape with a little bend in it. And here are your microvilli of your small intestine. So they colonize the small intestine and then they secrete a cholera toxin. And we'll talk about the mechanism of action for the cholera toxin in a moment. Now, we have a number of epidemics. They tend to always be in underdeveloped countries, at least modern day epidemics are in underdeveloped countries where some sort of water infrastructure has, uh, is either not developed or has been damaged. So one of the more recent ones was in Haiti. After the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, all of their infrastructure was damaged. People were like drinking out of the rivers and there was cholera in the river and a whole bunch of people got sick. That outbreak lasted 10 years. 
the World Health Organization finally put out something, I think earlier this year, that said, okay, we feel like the outbreak is more or less over. Now, the earthquake killed like 200,000 people, but cholera after that still killed like a couple thousand people. So what is the mechanism of action? Well, if you know anything about the anatomy or the physiology of the small intestine, then you know that this is the area where we draw water, we absorb water. So you drink fluid and then you absorb it across your intestinal wall into our bloodstream. Ion movement, specifically sodium and chloride, is what drives that. So sodium and chloride moves and then water follows via osmosis. So as long as sodium and chloride are moving in this direction here from the intestinal lumen, that's the center of the intestine, into the blood, then water follows. The cholera toxin reverses that. So the cholera toxin actually reverses the ion flow and pumps ions out of the cells into the lumen. Well, guess what? Water follows. So when water follows, then you, instead of absorbing water, you're actually taking water from your blood and dumping it out into your intestine. Well, as your intestine fills up with water, you basically let it all go and you have massive amounts of watery diarrhea. So survival is about surviving dehydration. As long as you can get an IV or something that can continually replace the water that you lose, then you should be able to survive. All right, so that ends our recording. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, again, email me if you have questions.